Hi, welcome to the first lesson of the lecture series on the environment and society. This video introduces us to the course and presents the first topic. In this slide is the winning work of Dennis Avdik in the 2019 Cal International Environmental Painting Contest. In his painting, Avdik presented the coexistence of humans and nature. Similarly, this course will also deal with human and environment relationship. This photo shows a nature reserve in the Netherlands where wild species are thriving. This 15,000 acre wilderness is filled with wildlife. Interestingly, all this wildlife is thriving in one of the most densely populated places by people. And what's even more surprising is that this wilderness is not natural. This reserve was created by biologists in the 1980s, and this park had previously been a muddy lowland devoid of wildlife. And this is actually a reclamation area. Over time, and with a careful introduction of various animals and plants, the landscape has been crafted to produce this. In other words, this is man-made. It is a product of human intervention. Others call this rewilding, a practice of conservation where ecological functions and evolutionary processes, which are thought to have existed in past ecosystems or before human influence, are deliberately restored or created. Rewilding often requires the reintroduction or restoration of large predators to ecosystems. But these wonderful landscapes raised many questions, such as, which animals are introduced and which are not? Are human-bred substitute ecologically acceptable? In a world desperate for the protection of existing wilderness, are expensive efforts at creating new wilderness practical or elitist? The first picture is of the Yellowstone National Park in the United States. The issues revolving around the Yellowstone National Park are also similar to that of the Netherland Reserve, both showing a metaphor for the condition of our long-standing relationship to the non-human world. Though heralded as a wilderness, the Yellowstone National Park was created through the violent eradication of the dozens of native tribes who lived in the region, transformed its landscapes, and relied on the resources of what would become a park devoid of people. On the other hand, the second picture is a coffee plantation that is very common throughout Asia and Latin America. Coffee plantations often teem with wild birds, mammals, and insects, all beyond the intent and control of farmers, conservationists, or anyone else, even though these areas are regarded purely as economic and artificial landscapes. These situations imply that although humans have exerted enormous influence on the earth, its complex ecology makes it very difficult to fully control our environment. So in this course, we shall explore varied interpretative tools and perspectives about environment and society relationships and apply them to a few familiar situations around us. By environment, we mean the whole of the aquatic, terrestrial, and atmospheric non-human world, including specific objects in their varying forms, like trees, carbon dioxide or water, as well as the organic and inorganic systems and processes that link and transform them, like photosynthesis, predator and prey relationships, or soil erosion. On the other hand, society includes the humans of the earth in the larger systems of culture, politics, and economic exchange that govern their interrelationships. So at the very beginning, we must acknowledge that these two categories are interlaced and impossible to separate. Humans are obviously environmental beings subject to organic processes, and environmental processes are also fundamentally social in the sense that they link people and influence human relationships. 
For example, photosynthesis is the basis of agriculture and perhaps the most critical environmental process in the history of civilization. Human transformation of carbon levels in the atmosphere may further alter global photosynthesis in a very dramatic way, with implications for human food and social organization. So obviously, it is difficult to tell where the environment leaves off and where society begins. However, there is not universal agreement on these relationships and linkages. So in this course, we will be learning dominant ways of interpreting the environment and society relationship. In this course, we will begin with a perspective that is foundational to the history of both the natural and social sciences, and that is population. In the next chapter, we will consider economic ways of thinking about the environment. This is followed by the approaches that stress institutions. In the next chapter, we will examine ethics-based approaches to the environment. The view of the environment as a problem of risk and hazard will be explored in Chapter 5. And this is followed by the description of political economy approaches in Chapter 6. And lastly, we will be describing approaches to environment and society issues that emphasize social construction. We will also consider a few critical subjects and examine them using the approaches. We will not discuss all socio-environmental interactions and problems. We will just consider a few examples to demonstrate the implications of divergent ways of seeing environmental issues. For our first lesson, let us consider these photos. These pictures show the densely populated metropolitan Manila. Metro Manila is one of the most densely populated cities in the world. In fact, in 2015, 2018, and 2020, it's in the number one spot. In 2020, it has the highest population density in the world with approximately 46,178 persons per square kilometer. And as we know, with each person comes the demand for resources, the production of wastes, and the disturbance of large areas for new home construction, and among many other things. Many explorations of the relationships between environment and society typically start in this scenario, asking basic questions such as, Are there too many people? Can the world support us all? If not, can human numbers ever be expected to stop growing? How and when? The concept of overpopulation is no longer new. Dr. Thomas Robert Malthus asserted that the capacity of population to grow is greater than the power of the earth to provide resources. Given the procreative capacity of humanity and the inherently finite availability of the Earth's resources, human population is the single greatest influence on the status of the Earth and its resources. On the other hand, the Earth's resources provide the most definitive and powerful limit for human growth and expansion. According to Dr. Malthus, population growth is effectively geometric or exponential, since the multiple offspring of a single mating pair of animals or people are each capable of producing multiple offspring themselves. On the other hand, Malthus argued that the food base for the growing population over time is essentially fixed or amenable to slight alteration through arithmetic or linear expansion. For example, Food supplies can grow by expanding agricultural lands, by using technology to increase agricultural production. But over time, population growth, which is exponential, would still outpace food production, which is linear. In his key written work titled An Essay on the Principle of Population, which he first published in 1798, Malthus suggested that wars, famine, poverty, 
and disease are natural limits to growth that keep population in check. He also claimed that policies promoting the welfare of the poor are counterproductive because they only encourage unnecessary reproduction and resource waste. He argued that the key to preventing resource crisis is a moral code of self-restraint. Malthus recognized that the poorest people were the most vulnerable parts of the population. He also insisted that efforts to sustain, protect, or subsidize the conditions of the poor were largely pointless because according to him, it just encouraged population growth. Malthus really had harsh assessment of the poor. He even suggested that the poor are reliant on donations or aids, that poor people are bad managers of time and money, and that they are given to irrational procreation. Rather than provide support for people, Malthus insisted that the best remedy to these crises is the expansion of moral restraint. Specifically, he intended the moral restraint of women, whom he held responsible for the maintenance of virtue and by implication for population control. He especially focused his criticism on less civilized people, whom he viewed as insufficiently capable of self-control and so inevitably given to poverty. Malthus' work shows social and political biases. He developed an explanation for poverty that excuses economic systems, political structures, or the actions of the wealthy or elite from fault. His specific moral vision of women, perhaps even by the standards of his own time, reflects a profoundly biased view of the relationship between women and men. The arguments of Malthus and his present-day followers raise questions about the relationship between society and environment and the nature of resource scarcity, its possible inevitability, and our capacity to overcome it. The questions raised by Malthus have been taken up by other scholars interested in relationships between population, economic development, and environmental impacts. One approach pioneered by Paul Ehrlich and John Haldron in 1974, seeks to measure the impact of human beings on the environment, taking seriously not only raw numbers of people but also their overall rate and type of consumption. They proposed that every additional person added an impact on the earth, though the exact rate of that impact was influenced by other factors including the average affluence of a population. For example, a person in Bangladesh uses far less water and energy than a person in the United States. Also, the availability of technology that might lessen human impact. For example, a population using solar power rather than coal power may have far lower carbon emissions depending on how solar panels are produced and how much energy their owners use. For this relationship, they developed a shorthand equation IPAT to determine the level of environmental impact I as a product of the population denoted as P, affluence denoted as A, and technology denoted as T. Hence, this formula. Here, environmental impacts are understood broadly as the deterioration of the resource base, the decline of ecosystems, the product of waste, and so on, while population is the number of people in a specific group, usually a country. Affluence, a measure that was not considered in any way by Malthus, is alternatively measured as either first the level of consumption of the population, or second, the per capita gross domestic product. In other words, one considers how many goods per capita or per person are consumed in that country or area, or the total production in the country, divided by the population. Technology, also not considered by Malthus, 
is the set of methods available to that population to produce the goods that are needed and consumed. This formulation certainly makes the relationship between population and environmental degradation even more complicated than Malthus did. Ehrlich explains that population requires the most immediate attention precisely because population is the most difficult and slowest to yield among the components of environmental deterioration. However, there are also critics to th this assumption. Barry Commoner argued that technology has by far the greatest influence on environmental impact, far outweighing the total number of people, specifically citing the petrochemical-based economy, pesticides, fossil fuels, and a range of modern developments that increase individual impact enormously. According to Commoner, environmental impact varies enormously based on the economics, and an alternative economy by implication would offset population growth. Others have argued that development radically lowers human impact at a rate far greater than the growth of population. In what some analysts call an environmental Kuznets curve, named for economist Simon Kuznets, it is predicted that as development initially occurs, environmental impact rise, but after reaching a state of overall affluence, human impact dramatically decreases. Proponents of this argument point out that in many parts of the developing world that have historically experienced high levels of deforestation, urbanization, and affluence, have left many rural areas abandoned, allowing a forest transition back to thick forest cover. So how do we measure the impact per person? There is the notion of carrying capacity, which is often invoked to signal the limits beyond which a local area can no longer absorb population. Carrying capacity is the number of people that could theoretically be sustained in one area or the earth in general over an indeterminate amount of time, assuming a particular lifestyle such as level of technology and consumption. It has been estimated, for example, that if we calculate carrying capacity based on an assumption that all people lived like people do in the United States, the Earth could sustain only 2 billion people. However, the concept of carrying capacity led to serious ethical questions. For example, who should be allowed to live at what standard of living? Is it reasonable to insist that the Philippines should stop developing any further so that levels of consumption in the United States and other first world countries can remain the same? So ethical questions such as those. Other more personal way of measuring environmental impact is examining one's own ecological footprint. The concept of ecological footprint can be done at multiple scales. Some people use it to analyze the environmental impacts of entire urban areas or even countries. Other people use it to estimate how their own daily practices like eating, showering, driving, using the bathroom, washing their clothes, etc. affect the environment. There are many websites available that allow users to enter their own data and receive a number representing their impact on the environment. But of course, you can always view this data with a degree of skepticism. But for many people, it is a real eye-opener. Now, given the many scenarios of famine, scarcity, and ecological disaster brought by population growth, it might be difficult to imagine that there are many thinkers, researchers, and historical observers who actually make the reverse argument that population growth is 
the root of innovation and civilization. Yet there is a great deal of evidence to support this claim. In this way of thinking, a growth in human numbers and the scarcity of available resources induced the search for alternative and new ways of making more from less. For example, agricultural development is driven by the demand for food of the growing population, as explained by Esther Bosrops in her classic analysis titled Conditions of Agricultural Growth. Over long periods of history, the amount of food produced on the same amount of land has increased exponentially because demands for food increases as the population grows. More people mean more food. This is known as induced intensification and can be extended to all kinds of other problems and natural resources. Owing to new cultivation techniques and input-heavy systems of agricultural production, the so-called Green Revolution, food production has boomed worldwide. So others believe that population growth does not always lead to scarcity. It sometimes results in increased resources. So what are the implications of thinking about environmental problems in strictly demographic terms? First, focusing on population distracts our attention away from other driving forces of environmental degradation, such as economy, society, or politics. For example, in India, during Gandhi's rule in the 1970s, dramatic measures were done to end overpopulation. There were mass sterilizations and even forced sterilizations in villages and slum areas. However, these measures did not reduce India's population growth. India's population growth rate just began to decrease recently as a result of complex political and economic factors, including women's rights and access to education. Second implication of strictly focusing on human numbers is that it tends to unjustly blame places and people who may have little or nothing to do with ecological change or negative environmental impacts. For example, while there may be a billion people in India, the United States, with one quarter of that population, emits more than five times the amount of carbon dioxide gas, a driver of global warming. More pointedly, Critics assert that making the politics of the environment a politics of population directs policy action, blame, and social control specifically unto women and their bodies. As Elizabeth Hartman argues in her critical book titled Reproductive Rights and Wrongs, the population problem is not really about human numbers but a lack of basic rights. Too many people have too little access to resources. Too many women have too little control over their own reproduction. Rapid population growth is not the cause of underdevelopment. It is a symptom of the slow pace of social reform. The rate of population growth around the world has fallen in the past few years. This graph shows population growth rates peaked in the 1960s and have steadily and continuously declined since then. So what makes population growth decline? What are the implications for human-environment relations in a world where population, while continuing to grow, is likely to reach stability in the next 50 years? To examine the demographic transition, we must consider the death rate and birth rate. The death rate is the measure of mortality in a population, typically expressed as the number of deaths per thousand population per year, while birth rate is the measure of natural growth in a population, typically expressed as the number of births per thousand population per year. The initial growth popu of population was caused by a decline in the overall death rate of the population. The death rate fell largely in response to better medicine and healthcare, which led to fewer deaths, especially of infants, 
women and childbirth, and other historically vulnerable populations. Obviously, if the death rate falls and the birth rate remains unchanged, population growth occurs, and often at an exponential rate. As long as birth rates are higher than death rates, more people enter a population than leave it. In the years of the late 19th and early 20th century, birth rates also began to fall, although there are many reasons for this decline, and some remain a matter of debate. In summary, human population growth holds serious implications for sustainability of environmental systems, especially as growth tends historically to be geometric or exponential. Environmental impacts of individual people and groups can vary enormously, owing to variations in technology and affluence. Population growth has often led to increased carrying capacity, owing to induced intensification and innovation. Carrying capacity and, and ecological footprint analysis can be used as indices to think about impacts of human individuals and populations. Malthusian thinking has severe limits for predicting and understanding human and environment relations, since population is an effect of other processes, including development and the rights and education of women.